Vicki Smith told me her parents split up 15 years ago in Chicago. She said her father took the children with him and refused any contact with their mother. It took Vicki 15 years to find her mother here in Oklahoma City. Vicki and her baby now live here with her mother and stepfather. Her problem was finding her sister in Chicago and trying to bring her here also. Well, she tracked down her sister Bernadette, but financial problems prevented Vicki from reuniting the family. Okay, I got a... I guess it's called part-time job. If I make $30 a week, it's that's a lot. Plus, I got a baby, you know, that's almost two years old, and I, and I can't just seem to get any better job because I don't have transportation. And uh, we're living on a small VA check from my stepfather, which is a little bit over $200. And it just seems impossible to get, you know, the money for her here. How much do you think uh, you uh, need to get her down here? I don't know. About ninety dollars. Yes. In your corner good guy, Dennis Randall of King Energy, donated the funds for this hardship case, and we purchased a plane ticket to bring Vicki's sister Bernadette to live in Oklahoma City. Vicki hadn't seen her in three years. Her mother hadn't seen Bernadette in 15 years. Well, Bernadette arrived today at Will Rogers Airport, and it was a joyful reunion. There she is, there she is. Where, where? Bernadette's plane landed right on schedule. Vicki and the family were there to greet her, of course. It was almost like greeting a stranger after such a long separation. Where? How are you? Bernadette met her stepfather and brother for the first time, and of course her mother for the first time in 15 years. You still on the airplane? Viewers calling in your corner are concerned with children here at the Apollo Elementary School, located in Bethany on Peniel Avenue. Many of the children live at nearby apartment complexes on the south side of Northwest 16th Street. Here's the problem. Peniel Street, coming down from Apollo Elementary, intersects here with Northwest 16th Street. And many of the children from Apollo Elementary travel down the rather narrow Peniel and cross over 16th to one of the many apartment complexes on the south side. Now, parents who pick their children up in cars jam up on Penile while waiting to turn left and right onto Northwest 16th in the midst of heavy late afternoon traffic. And it's in the midst of all that that many of the children from Apollo Elementary are crossing 16th Street unsupervised. To complicate matters, part of the intersection, the northwest corner, is in Bethany. The rest is in Oklahoma City limits. The dividing line is in the middle of Northwest 16th and in the middle of Penile. Parents concerned about children crossing over 16th Street have complained to both cities, especially after a child ran in front of a car last month and was injured. There is uh, no crosswalk here that uh, the children can cross safely. Uh, the lines, as you can see, are just about gone, and we need some type of, of um, traffic um, control here because people, they don't slow down going through the school zone. Uh, you mentioned that a policeman had come out here for traffic control for a while. Well, what he did was he sat right there and back there and stopped cars for speeding. Uh -huh. But as far as, as uh, you know, getting out and helping the children, they've done nothing and then they would only stay here a day or two and I come this way every day so and I haven't seen them but a day or two in your corner monitored the situation last Friday when children began leaving school just after 3 30 and I began to see what the parents and the PTA were talking about the children proceeded down Penile towards the crossing at 16th Street there was no one to supervise the crossing the children look for oncoming cars and get across the best they can. Some of the traffic on 16th Street stops for them. 
but other cars do not. Some children seem to plead with the cars to let them across. Meanwhile, on the intersecting Penile Street, parents who've picked up their children in cars try to make a turn onto 16th Street. I took the problem of children crossing in congested traffic to Dennis Kirk, head of Oklahoma City's Transportation Division. He was aware that a child had been hit at the intersection. From what we have found out so far, this appeared to be an error on the child who darted out in front of a vehicle. The vehicle that uh, struck the child was not speeding. She was well within uh, the speed limit in the school zone. Wouldn't that still indicate the need for a school crossing guard? A patrol person would have to be approved by the traffic commission. Uh -huh. And as yet, we haven't had a request for that. And uh, our records don't indicate that that's warranted. Kirk said their traffic surveys show 85% of the motorists drive at 26 miles an hour or less through the school zone and that there are sufficient gaps through traffic for children to cross. He was thinking of putting in a pedestrian walkway either on the north or south side of 16th where children could walk. That still doesn't address the issue of supervising children across 16th Street. In Your Corner went back for a second and a third look and found few cars slowing down through the school zone intersection. Even a school bus speeded through. Another parent told us of her efforts to slow the traffic. Well, I took a ping pong paddle out here earlier in the year and made a stop sign out of it, and the cars wouldn't stop for me. And I'm a lot bigger than a kid, and I was putting her hit three times. It's just the fact that it's totally unorganized. They'll cross anywhere they want to cross. They're dodging through the cars and uh, trying to get around the cars that are trying to turn left or right off of Penile onto 16th or the traffic that's traveling back and forth on 16th. And there's nobody there to show them when to cross or what time, so they're just jumping back and forth through the cars. Ray McCormick, who has watched the intersection for five years, says there is an additional problem of potholes in the northbound lane of Penile. Traffic avoids that side, and they try to drive up the smooth side, forcing cars closer to the school children. Plus, he says it is a short school zone with no flashing lights. Some motorists don't realize they're in it until they're almost out of it. Linda Hageman, a viewer from Norman, told me she had taken her pink polo shirt to New Way Cleaners in Norman. She took it back twice because of black marks on it. The next time it came back, there was a brown stain on the shirt, so it went back to New Way again, and this time, she said it came back worse. And I didn't worry about it. I went ahead and wore the shirt, and when I returned it to the cleaners then for the third time is when the sleeve was unironed and the shoulder was scorched. And what did they tell you? Um, they told me that they really couldn't do anything about it. If, if I wanted them to, they would take it to Oklahoma City and have the um, manager up there look at it. Linda said New Way manager Guy Bellamy in Oklahoma City was rude and refused to pay her for the faded shirt. Well, Guy told me he did not feel responsible that many of the polo shirt emblems faded. He said they are made with different materials in different locations. Some faded, some did not. Some were imitations of the polo shirt. And he said his laundry did not use bleach on the shirts. We asked a store carrying the line of polos. They said if laundered according to instructions, they have heard a few problems with them. We took the shirt to the Dry Cleaners Association, where Dorothy Bennett told me there have been problems with some of the polo shirts in commercial laundering. She examined Linda Hageman's shirt and asked if Linda had laundered the shirt at home. Linda confirmed that she did. Dorothy felt a bleach in the detergent may have caused the fading, but to be certain, we sent it off to the International Fabric Air Institute for laboratory tests to see who was at fault in the fading. Well, the shirt came back this week, and Dorothy showed me the test results. They said that it had been, it obviously, the emblem had faded, and that it must have been in the repeated commercial washings that the dye was not commercially laundered. And then when she washed it at home, or maybe she'd washed it at home in between laundries, that it caused the emblem to fade. Now, Dorothy said the lab tests were unbiased, and she showed me some results of cases where the laundry was at fault. However, in this case, she feels New Way laundry was not at fault for the fading of the polo emblem or the polo shirt. 
At last, I returned the shirt to Linda Hegeman in Norman, who felt certain her laundering of the shirt at home did not cause it to fade. Well, the shirt was bleached out in, um, in October, and I didn't wash the shirt till just a couple weeks ago. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you have some friends who do those shirts at home all the time rather than taking them to a cleaners, and what do they tell you when you ask them about it? They use the same kind of detergent that I used the one time that I washed my shirt and um, have had no problem, have washed it time and time again and without any fading, no fading to the emblems. I see, and no fading to the shirt in general. Right. I see. I got a call from Marcy Wheeland, who works at Harbingers, an organization that helps women with alcohol problems. She said they had also been trying to help a young kidney patient. A resident of the Candle Lake Senior Citizens Home asked a Harbingers employee to collect empty cigarette packages. What story did they tell you when they initially asked you to that start saving? It was for uh, a child, to buy time for a child on a kidney dialysis machine. Okay. Now, when you started... Uh, checking around about this, what did you find out about this uh, child? The... Well, we found out that it was a 10-year-old a boy that uh, got 10 minutes per every, every 10 cigarette packages that were saved at Midwest City Hospital. That... However, Marcy called the Oklahoma Kidney Foundation and learned that the Midwest City Hospital did not even have a kidney dialysis machine. That made her suspicious. So she called Jane Bell, who allegedly had been asking people to save the cigarette packages. Yes, I talked to Jane Bell. And what did she say? She told me initially uh, the same thing as she told Phyllis, uh -huh. uh, that it was for a 10-year-old boy and that uh, she resented my uh, questioning her about it being a scam and uh, was a little rude and said that she wouldn't put her name beside some, behind something that wasn't legitimate. Did she identify this boy? Except she did not tell me that she sold the packages to a company. Uh -huh. She just told me that the boy got 10 minutes per every cigarette package that was turned in. I checked at the Candle Lake Senior Citizen Center and the director confirmed that a resident, a friend of Jane Bell, asked other residents to save cigarette packages. Uh, Vida came to me about oh, probably a month ago and said that a friend of hers asked her to collect cigarette packages for a boy in a hospital on a dialysis machine that every nine or ten minutes for every so many cigarette wrappers that were turned in it would pay for his dialysis. So she had, I had made up a little note for her and hung it on our bulletin board out here for all the residents to see. And the apartment manager put a bag, or Vida put a bag in the apartment manager's office and had everybody bring their cigarette wrappers down there. So probably anybody that smoked or smokes in the complex left uh, wrappers with her. I went to visit Jane Bell to find out why she allegedly asked people to save cigarette packages. After she took us into her office, she said she wanted no publicity and no interview. She said she was helping the handicapped in her own little way. I asked her to name the boy who needed kidney dialysis. Perhaps we could help him. She said the parents wanted no publicity. She refused to name the youth or answer any other questions. She said she had checked with the family to see if they would talk with me and she would call me back. I asked if she would tell me the name of the Midwest City firm that pays money for empty cigarette packages. She refused to answer that question as well. Still puzzled, I went to the Oklahoma Kidney Foundation and asked Phyllis Barber what might be going on here. This rumor crops up at least twice a year at every affiliate, National Kidney Foundation affiliate over the United States. I've been to regional meetings and they've all said, it's up again, we, we can't find out a basis for it. So we've, we've met this problem before. And I said, uh, what we need to know is actually some names. Who is the patient? Where does it get treatment? Who's doing it? Because we're interested in helping patients too.
in your corner was contacted by Mrs. Ora Kapanos. Four years ago, Mrs. Kapanos bought a home security, panic, and fire alarm system from Preferred Security Systems in Norman. Alan Dorn, agent and then part owner, sold the system to Mrs. Kapanos for $1,170. Less than two years later, Mrs. Kapanos received a letter from Alan Dorn stating that her contract had been sold to security engineers in Oklahoma City and that her monthly maintenance fee would be $1,850 instead of $1,250 per month. After one month, uh, Alan Dorn told us to send the February payment to him and then after that, the March payment on would be to the other company, but he was going to work with them. He would be with them for a few months to see that they, everything went all right. Mrs. Capano said six months had gone by when Alan Dorn stopped by the house. He said he'd come by to see if she was satisfied with the service from security engineers. Alan Dorn then allegedly told Mrs. Kapanos of a way to save her monthly maintenance fee. All she had to do was purchase a different control box for $485. This box would eliminate her monthly fee, and she would be charged only for repairs, which he said rarely happens. Dorn also said the complete system could be hers and could be sold with a house. Well, Mrs. Kapanos agreed and bought the control box. Even after purchasing the new box, she continued to receive monthly maintenance bills from security engineers. Well, after numerous calls to Alan Dorn, she contacted security engineers and told them about the new control box. Finally, I called them and asked them why. Was I getting those 1850? And they said, well, it's for your, your system out there. And I said, well, we have our own box now. And they said, where'd you get it? I told them we bought it from Alan Dorn. And they said, well, he has nothing to do with our company. So I tried to call him then and couldn't get him. This is the copy of the letter that I got from Alan Dorn, mm -hmm. which led me to believe that he was still with the company. Okay. And this was okay. on January the 30th. So in this letter, it says, in the months to come, we will be working closely with security engineers to ensure that your lease, maintenance, and monitoring service is prompt, uninterrupted, and of the high quality which you expect and deserve, which led the customer to believe that Alan Dorn was associated with the security engineers company. However, Bill Norfleet of Security Engineers denied any association with Alan Dorn. He said Mrs. Kapanos had to honor her five-year contract. So he took out Alan Dorn's Code 3 alarm box and reconnected his company's controls at no charge to Mrs. Kapanos. But she was stuck with a $485 alarm control box she couldn't use. She said she hasn't been able to reach Dorn to ask him for a refund for six months. I couldn't reach him at his Code 3 office in Norman, but found him at his home treating his dogs. Above the roar, Dorn said he hadn't heard from Mrs. Kapanos, but claimed he had told her she could terminate her contract and her monthly payments with security engineers by giving them a 30-day notice. He said he would help her do this or buy back his control box. I'll either refund her money or help her get out of the contract, and I'll give her the option of whichever she wants to do. Okay. Testing, testing. Testing, 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 testing. Testing, 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 testing. Test, test, testing, testing, testing. One, two, three. Test. Test, test, test. Son of a bitch. Testing, testing, testing. Testing, testing, testing.
Darlene and Ray Stevens say their home means a lot to them, and it must. The Stevens house has burned down twice in the past few years, and they've rebuilt it each time. But here's the latest problem. Darlene ordered a lawn sprinkling system for their yard as a surprise gift for her husband. Well, it turned out to be a surprise for both of them. It never was finished. Darlene says they paid Mike Harkins of Lawnmaster Incorporated a third down, $600, and a third when the job began, a total of $1,200. Now she's left with a half-done job, holes in the yard and dirt in the swimming pool. The dirt is coming in there because there's no grass, and the wind is blowing it into the pool, and we need to get that sodded. We can't do it. We can't do the shrubs, and we can't do the sodding or anything, because if they're going to come along and dig trenches, which we wanted him to finish the yard because we wanted to be on sprinkler. Darlene says they signed the contract last November, but the job was begun by Lawnmaster in December when they started digging trenches for the underground pipes. Well, the men left and came back in January to finish digging the holes. Then they came back in February and laid some of the pipe and dug a hole in the front yard and left it uncovered. The Stevens fear they might be sued if someone fell in it. When they called Mike Harkins of Lawnmaster, he gave them various reasons for not finishing the job. The Stevens gave him a deadline for finishing, which he did not meet. Meanwhile, the Stevens found Harkins was working on another job. He's doing those apartments out there, and why is he doing theirs when here we are? And sure enough, while the Stevens job remains unfinished, in your corner found the Lawnmaster crew working on a Northwest Oklahoma City apartment complex. I found Mike Harkins and asked him about finishing the Stevens job. Well, I intended to, and I had explained some problems that I had, uh, personal problems, and. Uh, explained to him that there was going to be some delays and Mr. Stevens called me last Tuesday and gave me a deadline of Friday uh -huh. and I just I could not meet that deadline. I had every intention of finishing the work I see. but I could not. Well they're a little uh, upset that you've got a job started up here and left that one unfinished. Yes and we've you know I've had some health problems and uh, I just uh, I've had some problems getting laborers especially to do dirt work and uh, I explained that to him and Mr. Stevens said that and unless I could finish it Friday, uh, he'd get somebody else to do it. And I, you know, I don't want that kind of a problem. Yeah. I want to finish the work. Well, and, when do you uh, think you can finish it for them? Uh, I can get back over there and finish it later this week, have it all finished up by sometime next week. Uh, the rain this weekend didn't help. Yeah. You know, I could have had somebody, probably they don't have any grass in the back. Right. And it's just solid mud over well, they're, there. Right they're now. waiting to put it put it down, but this yeah. is holding them up. But the uh, I was under the impression they were going to get somebody else to finish it, and I, I, that's not a situation that I want well, at they, all. They've already paid you a certain amount of money, yes. you know, and, yeah. and they kind of like to see it finished up by, by your people. Yeah. And well, I, you know, if they want me to finish it, that'll be fine, but I just could not meet his, the, the deadline that he, you know, imposed. And, and I, you know, I agree the problems have been uh, not all my, you know, not all not all my fault, not all their fault, uh -huh. but, you know, but uh, it just, I just could not meet that deadline, and, and when he put it on me, I, I didn't even try to meet him, mm -hmm. so that's okay. where we stand, and I had not heard from them. Okay, well, I, again, I just want to communicate then. to you that they do want, want you to finish it, if you will, and Okay. may I communicate back to them that you'll finish it this yes, week? Yes, sir. Yes, right. or by the first part of next week, I'll get back on it. a visit this week to the Oklahoma County Dispute Mediation Service in downtown Oklahoma City. It's located on Broadway in the Neighborhood Services Organization building. I met Kathy Williamson there who explained what the Dispute Mediation Service can do for our citizens. There's a need to get the people out of the court system that don't really belong there. They're tying up the courts, they're tying up police time. They're not getting the response that they probably want or need. They're not getting to resolve the conflict themselves, they're having a judge come down with some ultimatum, and that may not work for a lot of people. They may not need that. They may just need to talk it out among themselves and come to their own solution. There is no charge for this service. Kathy says the program is sponsored by the Metro Alliance for Safer Cities, which is funded through grants and donations. She says they will help mediate disputes in almost any type of situation. 
Uh, tenant landlord disputes, neighbor against neighbor, merchant against customer, or vice versa. Um, that's about it, really. We try to stay away from domestic violence situations involving husband and wives or children. That really needs to be referred to more of a counseling agency than we are. We're mediators, not counselors. I asked Kathy for an example of how the mediators work. Uh, we would call the complaining party or the complaining party would call us and we would get the gist of the problem that they're having, find out a good time for them to come in and meet with um, the mediator and the responding party and then we would call the second party or the responding party and tell them who we are, explain that we are not a legal service, we're here to help them resolve the problem that this person is having with them that we're free of charge, uh, we have different areas around town, and then just try to correlate the two people and get a good time. And then we assign a mediator to the case, and then they come in and mediate it. Kathy says the mediators don't impose a settlement on the disputing parties. They help the two parties in finding their own solution. Then the mediators do two follow-ups to see if further help is needed in settling a dispute. There are 20 mediators now, all trained by the American Bar Association. Not training in law, but training in guiding the conversation towards a solution. She says there are five or six locations around town where the mediation sessions can be held, and they are anxious to work on your disputes. So you can reach them at 236-0413 or 236-0521 in Oklahoma City. That's 236 or 236 0521